Shalom, I'm Dr. Diana Dye with Foundations in Torah and Bible Interact TV. And we are now in the second session of our series, Early Morning Blessings. And I did recommend last time, uh, there's a series that goes before this called Service of the Heart that really gives you all the background information of how the prayer service developed. And we ended that particular series talking about putting on the tallit and the tefillin and the tzitzit and all that sort of thing. We talked about the early morning blessing of when one first awakens and how that's a rehearsal for the resurrection. This particular series, which is four parts, takes us then from the actual first prayer that uh, we call Mato Vu, or how goodly are your tents, the idea of entering into the tents of God in a humble and submissive way beginning Baruch, this term for blessing, we, we're going to see because these morning blessings uh, are built on that concept of bowing one's knee or prostrating oneself before the Lord. So we finished up last time, we talked about Matovu in a lot of detail and the idea of the tents and entering into the tents and the tents of the patriarchs and what that all means. But now we're going to move. Now, if you were going through your Siddur, your prayer siddur, you would find after you go through that prayer, it would be the time for the washing of the hands. So there's an opportunity for you at home to actually wash your hands in the same way that the priests would have washed their hands. Now they couldn't really do anything in the temple unless they washed their hands and their feet before it was uh, moving them into a higher level of sanctity, if you will. So this was their way to prepare to enter into the presence of God. And it was a commandment that they wash their hands and feet from the kior. And they're not exactly 100% sure how the kior was constructed. It was certainly different in the days of Solomon. But this is an artist's rendition of what it might have looked like at the time of the Second Temple period. So before they entered into the temple precincts for their daily service to God, they had to wash their hands and feet in a laver. That was the vehicle used that had spigots and the water needed to be moving. And so this was designed in a way, this Kior thing, if you will, uh, was raised and lowered and it was uh, had to have moving water, literally Maim Haim, moving water. And it had to have spigots where they could put their hands and feet under in order to wash them. So the laver, the, in the, certainly this goes back to the first temple period. In, uh, this, it had actually 12 spigots on it. Now, you, if you'll recall, uh, Yeshua had, had admonished the Pharisees and the Torah teachers who only focused on the outward expression of the individual and not on the inward expression. And so we get to Mark 7, it talks about the Talmudim eating bread while their hands were not washed. So this is very much uh, an important part of the tradition of Israel of the washing of the hands. And that if they didn't carefully wash their hands in the manner prescribed by the leaders, then they would defile the bread and the food. So certainly there was a, a specific way in which the priests were to wash their hands and feet. But the idea was it was, it was to raise your spiritual level or to move you from one level to another, to raise your spiritual sanctity. But the inward intent was key and that's what Yeshua was trying to communicate. So you can go around washing your hands all day long, but if, if there's no change, if the inward intent of your heart is not to raise one's level to come into the presence of God, then you haven't done anything. It always was about the attitude. So consider every day the priests had to do this. They would come in the temple precincts and they had to go and wash their hands and feet. Well, it would just become another ritual. So they had to fight that as well, that it wasn't just this ritual, that, but that something was being accomplished so that they could enter into the presence of God. It must have been very easy to just forget about that. You wake up, it's time, you go over to the Kior, you wash your hands and feet, and you do this every single morning. It's kind of like you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth or whatever. I mean, you just do it. You don't even think about it. It's just what you do every day, and it loses what it's the value that it's supposed to bring to you. So maybe the teeth brushing isn't exactly a good comparison, but that's the idea of anything that's repeated over and over again. It is a fight to keep it special, to keep it fresh, um, and to be able to enter the presence of God in that regard. Of course, Psalm 51 is uh, verse 12, create in me a clean heart. God, renew in me a resolute spirit. Don't thrust me away from your presence. Again, this idea of the cleansing of the hands and feet having to do with the inward uh, expression of the heart that comes out. These, um, 
the, the regular prayers were something that it would have been very easy to slip into this sort of uh, the state in which it was just rote and it would, had no life to it. But one, God is it's a reminder that when we come into his presence, we not only do we, ha we come into his presence, but we have to prepare to come into his presence. And that this whole idea of the kavanah or the attitude of the heart and, uh, and the priest having to do the same thing. So we, it's that, um, it says you don't take pleasure in sacrifices as bird offerings without the right attitude. It isn't that you're not supposed to do the offerings and make the burnt offerings, but always it's the attitude of the heart. And with the attitude of the heart, God's spirit comes with that. And we don't want him to remove our spirit because our hearts are far from what it is that we're doing. What does God say that my offering is, uh, what is, it says in Psalms, my offering, Psalm 51, my offering is a broken spirit and a contrite heart that you won't despise. And so that is always the goal to come into his presence with a broken spirit and a contrite heart. And it is through uh, that kind of a heart that God can move and he'll answer your prayers and, and he'll teach you many things and you'll learn to hear his voice and all the various uh, aspects of that. So even in that prayer, in that, uh, in that psalm, it talks about in order to do this, you, one must first rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now, of course, that's in a physical sense, but we want to rebuild sort of the walls of our, of our heart, not constructing walls that God can't get in, but walls that have been broken down and damaged. And we know that he delights in, in the sacrifice, the burnt offering. He delights in that offering and in those whole offerings upon his altar. The walls actually of Jerusalem were, can be compared to the tents, if you will, the walls of the tent going back to our first session or the tent panel, if you recall, that was all around the tabernacle. That was how sons were added. So the walls that, of Jerusalem needing to be rebuilt after the destruction of the temple and the city, just like the rebuilding or the building of the tent walls, just like the building of the tent panels around the tabernacle, this is how the kingdom is expanded. And I mentioned last time through sons because sons were compared to the tent panel as the tent grew and panels were added. That was a picture of the family being enlarged through sons. And that's the key to the expansion of the kingdom of heaven. It's sort of a similar uh, concept. Now from Psalm 24, it says, who can stand in his holy place? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. They will receive a blessing from Adonai and justice from God, the God who saves them. And so there, even though we read this and we just go, well, those are really nice words that I can stand on, but it really meant something concrete. And so it really was pointing to an outward act that the priests had to perform day after day. Again, not losing the intent and motivation of the heart, but that this physical act became a spiritual reality. And that is, of course, in the morning as you enter into his presence and you may actually wash your hands in a physical way, but the idea is coming into his presence with clean hands and a pure heart before you even begin to go through many of the prayers. And so, again, we have to fight that rote experience to, so that it becomes fresh and new each, each day. Now let's, uh, we're going to look at some of the actual, there's a series of prayers that go here uh, for the Torah after the hands are washed. washed. And let me just read these first. Uh, the, this isn't the actual prayer, but one had an obligation to study the Torah every day. There in this inserted here after the washing of the hands was, were three blessings related to that. And uh, they incorporated certain study selections, if you will, in the morning. We'll talk about that in just a second. And they also, in this portion in the Siddur, included s selections from the Mishnah. And it was said that it was the duty to honor one's parents, visit the sick, and study the Torah. This is really the foundation of the faith, honoring one's parents, studying the Torah, and, of course, visiting and taking care of the sick and the widows and the orphans, etc., but studying the Torah became the sort of paramount commandment because that's how you know what God's will is in your life and the life of the community. So um, obviously people are very busy. So the, what the rabbis did was if you were too busy to basically uh, study the Torah, these certain selections were put in there for you into the morning service so that you could study. 
So there would be, um, one would study the basic uh, priestly benediction from Numbers 6, 24 through 26. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. And then there'd be other selections in there from the Mishnah and the Talmud. But the, this was important as well as, as I mentioned, studying, uh, visiting the sick and honoring one's parents. And these all were attitudes of the heart that one prepared oneself each morning and incorporated these, these into one's life. So let's just look quickly at the three blessings that go with the Torah. Blessed are you, there's our word Baruch, Atah Adonai Eloheinu, King of the universe who sanctified us by his commandments and commanded us to occupy ourselves with words of the Torah. So that would be one of the blessings for the Torah. Another would be, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who teaches the Torah to your people Israel. And the third, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all the nations and given us your Torah. So it's just a reminder, the central place that the Torah had in one's life. But as you can imagine, you can just say those prayers every morning and you can forget what they even mean. It's very easy to do. It wouldn't take very long. So again, it's hard to keep it fresh. It's hard to keep it at that point where you want to act on it, where it's very much a heart thing and not just a mind thing that you're just passing along. But the Torah, again, just establishing it in the morning is a time that's critical and setting, so setting time aside for doing that. And so, in a sense, in the service, the Torah was being symbolically studied, if you will, by everyone that was in the community. Obviously, that doesn't constitute actual study, and I, I'm not suggesting that in any way. But a reminder to us that perhaps sometime in that day, we can set aside time to study the Torah. Even if it's 10 or 15 minutes a day, at least establishing the discipline and the pattern and the habit in our, in our lives. All of this really connecting to a, a time of meeting God. Uh, there's an the expression there, la hasok badivre. It is the idea of setting time aside to study the Torah, to labor and toil in that study. So there is a much emphasis, even in the Siddur, about studying and observing the precepts of the Torah, and that one must occupy oneself with, with those words. And one has to take on the responsibility of that that goes with that study. So once you have learned things in the Torah, one is required to act upon them. So that's a whole other challenge in itself. Now, uh, from Romans 7, 22, it says, For in my inner self, I completely agree with God's Torah. So again, a daily reminder, you put the Torah first, you set time aside to study, to build up your spiritual life. That's the key, especially as we see the days growing darker and darker. This is the only way with your prayer life and with your time and study in the Torah, and certainly the remainder of the scriptures built from that. And we know that Yeshua himself is really the Torah personified who dwelled among us. This is a quote from, uh, in Hebrews 8.10, but it comes from Jeremiah 31.22. I will put my Torah on their hearts and write it on their minds. This is the covenant which I will make with them after those days. So that's, that's kind of a key here. And uh, this is the, by Yeshua's death, his burial, his resurrection, and the Holy Spirit that has come and moved and dwelled inside us, uh, allowing us that the Torah would be written on our hearts. Now this hasn't come really in its fullness yet because we're still in physical bodies. But the idea of the Torah, um, that life, the spirit on those words, because you can obey all the Torah you want, but if there's no life to it, if the spirit isn't upon it, if it isn't because of the love and submission and attitude of the heart, then it, it bears no fruit. Now it, this isn't for salvation. Following a Torah commandment doesn't save you, but it allows you to walk close to your God, to hear from Him, to come in a sanctified way and approach Him. Because I think the number one thing we all want to know is what is He saying to us? I, he doesn't speak in an audible voice, but He speaks in this manner through His Word. So that's key. Now, following this, that particular uh, portion with the three blessings on the Torah, we have a series of what we call the 15 blessings. And 15 is a very important number in Hebrew thinking. It represents the highest level to worship God. It is the level in which one is in His presence. 
And so a lot of the prayers are designed on the number 15. Certainly the name of God, Yah, has a value of 15, a Yod and a He. Um, come out to be 15. And we see this, uh, the themes of the kingdom all through the series of the 15 blessings. So here are the sort of themes of the kingdom being manifested in this, in these blessings, giving sight to the blind, clothing the naked, releasing the bound, straightening the bent. And these again are all kingdom attributes. And you can find this mostly from uh, Psalm 146 is the place that it's expressed. Now in Matthew 25, 35, it also points us to hear this parable, the Son of Man coming in His glory. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you made me your guest. I needed clothes and you provided them. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Again, these are all the attributes of the kingdom. And this prayer in particular, but certainly all the prayers that we have, focus on these responsibilities. It's no good being in your home and making and pontificating with great prayers and then going out and doing nothing when someone's in need. So this, this, the prayer time is supposed to finally tune you for the needs of those in the community and, and the needs of the widows and the orphans and the fatherless and those that are sick and setting the captive free, etc. This is the point of that special time when God is in your, you, you're in his presence and he's dwelling with you, is he is uh, putting this in your heart so that, but you have to act on it. He's not going to just do it zappo. He's using you. You are the instrument to go out and, and to do this and to take care of these things. It's an important daily reminder and it's important for you to act upon that. Here's a quote. It says, if you haven't prayed for the kingdom, you haven't prayed. So again, the kingdom, all those attributes are part of the kingdom. And those are the things that, that's being talked about here in, in terms of praying for the kingdom. So not praying for those things, you haven't prayed at all. You haven't prayed that the kingdom will come in its fullness. The 15 blessings are really all about the king and his kingdom. So one of them starts out, who gave the heart, to, to, of, uh, who gave the heart understanding to distinguish between day and night or rather the idea of being able to, disting to distinguish between the present age in which we live in and the future age to come. To recognize that that future age to come, the world to come, the Olam Haba, is the place that's been set, been set aside for all time for the righteous. The prayer speaking of the restoration then of the spirit and the body at the time of the resurrection. And in, in a contrast, between the decay of this present age in which we live in that continues to decay. Now there is, I must add, a very controversial part of this particular prayer, these 15 blessings, that ask God to bless me for not having made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. So this definitely causes a lot of problems, a lot of heartburn for people. And so what I say, it, the idea of this prayer to me is that the idea of being fulfilled to one, for one to fulfill their eternal destiny, whether they're a man, a woman, or a, a non-Jew, let's put it that way. So within Israel, there were many different callings, callings for men, certain callings upon women, and certainly slaves at that time, and certainly non-Jews. And so men, as men prayed this prayer, that sounds like they're uh, putting women out uh, outside the camp, basically what they're saying is, if you can kind of look at it this way, that they're grateful for the calling that's been placed on their lives as a man because that calling upon them created extra responsibilities and burdens. And they were all too happy to take upon those extra responsibilities and burdens and lighten the load of women and those that were slaves and those that are non-Jews. And so there should, they had great joy in taking on those responsibilities to remove the weight or the burden uh, off, off of the others, off of women and off of, off of the non-Jews. So it's a little bit different way to look at it. Uh, the men were considered to be the guardians of the commandments of God and that women were the guardians of the family. They were responsible for the molding of the family, the instruction in the family, the teaching of the children, etc. So each had its role to play, both extremely vital for the family to continue for the kingdom to grow. And then we have this from Galatians 3.28, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. 
that in Messiah there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor freeman, there's neither male nor female, for in union with the Messiah you are all one. So it would appear that Shaul, Rav Shaul, or Paul, familiar with the blessing that we just sort of looked at, uh, is explaining this prayer as it relates to the new covenant. And perhaps, just perhaps, this particular quote from Galatians is simply a midrash or a comment or a commentary on this particular prayer from the New, T new uh, Testament. So that if you belong to the, to the Messiah, you are the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. And so it matters not whether you are Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. That provision is the same for everyone. Now we move on from that particular blessing to something that I, I consider, I enjoy reading this every day as well as much as I can, the Akeda or the binding of the sacrifice. This is part of the daily morning readings from Genesis 22. And it has been incorporated in many of the Siddur, Siddurim, uh, but not everywhere and not all congregations, certainly. Some congregations recite this individually, so at you, as you are at home praying, some have it inserted as part of the public worship. Again, it's read every day, including Shabbat, but the most significant time it's read is that of Rosh Hashanah, the second day of Rosh Hashanah. So the, it, it recalls Abraham bringing Isaac, who was the burnt offering, and giving of everything that he had in total submission to God, this offering, including his own seed. And so the emphasis on the kingdom growing through the seed, and here Abraham is about to kill the seed, but it, uh, his willingness to offer his son Isaac and Isaac's willingness or readiness to be the offering. Well, we don't even think about that, but Isaac was fully prepared to be that offering. And that's something that we rarely discuss uh, when, we, when we talk about that. Certainly the location that Abraham built the altar there was said by the, the, um, the sages to be the site of the altar in the temple in Jerusalem, the place of the altar of both of the temples. And they say, for this was the very place from which Adam, the first man, was created. So this location of the altar that has become the site for the second, first and second temple is said to be the same site where man himself was created. It was the same site where Cain killed Abel, the same place where Jacob rested his head and had the vision of the ladder, the same place where um, Abraham offered his son Isaac on that altar. And so uh, also it was uh, said, and then we don't, can't prove this, but that uh, when Noah built an altar after he came off the ark, ark this was in fact the same, the same place. Now this is from um, Bereshit Rabbah. This is a commentary, 14.6. It says, man was created from the very spot which atones for him. So again, you see they've made the connection between that spot that Adam was created and the place of the altar. And uh, again, this is Mount Moriah, the place that Abraham bound Isaac and to put him on that altar. And uh, this was always in the minds of the sages, the place that, um, the future place of the atonement, if you will. So it's said, if you read that passage in Genesis 22, and most of it's quoted in this, it talks about him binding Isaac on the fourth day. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, there's a lot of elements in the story of Genesis 22 and the binding of Isaac that relate to the pattern of Rosh Hashanah, which is the time of the inauguration of the kingdom, the coming of the kingdom. Of course, we know it through the death and burial and resurrection of Messiah. Isaac was that same picture, um, but that he was bound on the fourth day. And when you consider the pattern of the 7,000 years to the history of man, Yeshua's first coming was in the fourth day or the 4,000 year. And his second coming would be in the seventh day or the 7,000 year. So the fourth day kind of patterns itself after what Yeshua would do in the course of history. And it talks about Abraham, of course he goes up, he attempts to uh, offer up his son. There's a substitute offering, the ram caught in the thicket, and he makes that offering. And then it says that he returns to his young men. So what's interesting there is that there is no mention of Isaac when Abraham returns to his young men. And the next time we see Isaac in scripture uh, is when his bride is being brought to him, Rebekah is being brought to him veiled. 
So we, there's nothing mentioned between that. So interesting picture of the bride being prepared to receive her groom, which is Isaac, which is a picture of the Messiah. So Isaac, like the Messiah, goes up to Mount Moriah carrying the wood, which we see in the story that Isaac is carrying the wood to uh, the wood that would be put on the altar and that the wood is laid and then Isaac is bound on top of that. And we don't, again, we don't see him until, uh, well, Eleazar is the one who brings Rebekah, the bride, to him in the land of Israel on her, with her 10 camels. And so Eleazar is kind of a picture of the one who helps or one who helps God is kind of a picture of the Holy Spirit. So lots of wonderful imagery in that story, so I would encourage you to read that each day. Uh, this is from the Mishnah to Anit 2.4. It says, May he who answered Abraham on Mount Moriah listen to our supplication. So as we read it, we're reminding God to answer us just in the same way that he answered Abraham. And we think that this is probably really one of the earliest allusions to the idea of prayer, in the, and, and it's now been inserted into the liturgy. Um, the, in the Gemara Rosh Hashanah 16a, it says that the use of the ram's horn on Rosh Hashanah began, began to be tied to this particular prayer because the ram was the offering in place of Isaac. It says, Remember in our favor, O Lord our God, the oath which you have sworn to our father Abraham on Mount Moriah. Consider the binding of his son Isaac upon the altar when he suppressed his love in order to do your will with a whole heart. And we go on, May your love suppress your wrath against us. And through your great goodness, may the, heart, or may the heat of your anger be turned away from your people, your city, and your heritage. So you see this idea of the covering from the wrath of God in the atonement that would have been brought by Isaac. Sort of, again, a similar picture. We go to James 2.21. It says, Wasn't Avinu Abraham, or Abraham our father, declared righteous because of, his, uh, because of actions when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith worked with his actions. Abraham had faith in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So again, it was the faith that made it complete, made this event complete, and that this passage in the Tanakh was fulfilled. God had, Abraham had faith in God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And really, this is the cornerstone of our walk, of our, the foundation of our walk is by faith. And one is declared righteous by acting on one's faith. So we're going to close out this particular session you know, continuing just uh, two more slides here with the idea of the Akedah and that Avraham is the foundation of all of this, the foundation of the faith, the foundation stone and the rock upon which the congregation is built. It's from Hebrews 11:7. It says, By faith, Avraham, when he was put to the test, offered up Isaac as an offering. Yes, he offered up his only son, he who had received the promises, for he concluded that God could even raise people from the dead. And it's very significant, I believe, that Yeshua talking about on this rock I will build my congregation is really talking about the rock of Abraham. That is the foundation of our faith. And so uh, it's the Akeda, Genesis 22, is read daily. It deals with the binding of Isaac. The site in which it takes place is the site of the altar on Mount Moriah where the future temple would be built. And again, it is a picture of the burnt offering because Isaac went as a burnt offering. And that was what they say is Isaac acted as a source of merit for the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, which is us. We are that offspring. Again, Isaac, a very wonderful picture of the Messiah and the source of our merit by Messiah's death on the tree and his resurrection. We are then the spiritual offspring of Abraham. So again, uh, the Akedah is that daily reminder. So that concludes uh, session number two, and we'll pick it up from here. We're going to be starting to talk about the burn offering and the whole um, incense offering as well. See you then. Shalom.